Good morning, everyone. Come on in. Have a seat. That's right. Hi, welcome back. I'm Adrian Badu, TCG's new Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer. I'm the ve oh. I'm very thrilled to be here and very excited to welcome you back to our second day at the National Conference here in Portland, the hub of maker culture and a city that knows how to party. Last night's opening party was amazing. I walked into the, the armory and I was greeted by Darth Vader in a kilt playing a bagpipe on a unicycle. Come on. Um, so I just want to say, you know, thank you to Cynthia Furman and the Portland Center stage for their generosity and opening their homes for us to party last night. So can we just give a few round of applause for those folks? <laughs> Speaking of this amazing city, it's now my pleasure to share a video of welcome from Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. She represents the first congressional district of Oregon, which comprises the northwest portion of the state. Welcome to Portland. I'm Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, and I'm honored to represent Northwest Oregon in Congress. During your stay, I hope you get to enjoy all that the Portland area has to offer. I was raised in a family that values the arts. My mother taught piano and painted. I dreamed of someday being a ballet dancer. Together, we visited art museums, and I've had a lifelong love for and appreciation of the arts. Now, as a policymaker, I've seen the arts and arts education change lives and build communities. Five and a half years ago when I arrived in Congress, everyone was talking about STEM. Policymakers pointed to the demand for workers with backgrounds in science, technology, engineering, and math. And they noted that we need them for the innovation economy. But nobody was talking about how people become innovative. I kept talking with educators, students, and businesses, and I started doing some research. It became clear that STEM is not enough. There was not enough focus on educating creative thinkers, and too often, girls and students of color were left, were left behind. I found out about STEAM, adding A for arts and design, and I started the Bipartisan Congressional STEAM Caucus, which now has 87 members. Together with my colleagues, we've championed well-rounded education that includes the arts, and we're showing government leaders and business leaders why this is important. Last year, I brought Jane Chu, the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, to Oregon. She observed students at two nationally recognized STEAM schools, integrating music, math, visual arts, science, filmmaking. She toured a new theater space coming to downtown Hillsboro, and we spoke with the Oregon arts community about how NEA resources can help local artists and creators. Our country faces many challenges, more than I can name in this message. We need, need creative and collaborative problem solvers to come up with new ideas and new ways to solve problems. We need to find ways to communicate effectively with people from all different backgrounds. We need scientists to be able to find new ways to address climate change. And we need everyone to have a stake in building a more just and inclusive society. I'm convinced now more than ever that the arts are not only essential to our economy, they're also essential to our humanity and to our democracy. As theater professionals, you know the value of storytelling and the power it holds in advocating for your values. So thank you, keep it up, and keep in touch. As we continue to advocate for the arts at the federal level, we'll need to continue developing meaningful relationships with folks like Congresswoman Susan Bonamici. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, now, this is my first time at the conference as a TCG staffer. I actually, um, this is like the full circle for me. I started as a member of TCG, then I joined the board for a couple years, and now they drew me in and I'm working for TCG. So, full circle. Um, and it also means it's my first time to address a conference audience from the plenary stage. So what else can I say? I want to talk about something I love about TCG and her field that speaks to her theme of full circle. I want to talk about mentorship, that electric two-way continuous magical exchange 
when leaders make a deep connection with each other and both lives are changed forever. I had the good fortune of working with Abe Rybeck at the Theater Offensive, an artist, a hero of mine, um, who took his work of inspiring outness to the streets in the depths of the AIDS crisis and who has never stopped fighting for justice. And now I have the opportunity to work with Teresa Eyring, one of the greatest managing leaders of our field and increasingly a dear friend. Abe and Teresa, you both inspire me. Thank you. We continue to learn so much from each other and we've come to understand how precious our time is together. Our exchange of information and ideas are not only beneficial to our field, but to our lives. We need each other that way. This exchange, like a circle, has no end. It's continuous and we're forever evolving. Very few theater leaders have responded to the call of that need like the recipient of her Visionary Leadership Award. To help me honor her, please join in welcome me to the stage, Megan Pressman. Good morning. I am, thank you, Adrian. I'm Megan Pressman. I'm the managing director at Woolly Mammoth. Uh, and Adrian has reminded me that this is absolutely a full circle moment for me as well. I first really got to know Susie when I joined Berkeley Rep in 2010 as the Associate Managing Director, which was a job created by TCG's New Generation Future Leaders Grant, yeah. right? Uh, and, and today I am a TCG board member and presenting Susie with a Visionary Leadership Award. So this organization is a truly remarkable source for circular motion. <laughs> Susie is a force. During the last almost three decades, she's grown Berkeley Rep by 450%, and both have become national leaders and national treasures in innovative theater work and in building communities. She was the president of LORT for several terms, to which she brought new structures and during which time she proudly oversaw the creation of a wonderful and necessary diversity initiative. She was board member and treasurer for TCG, and over her many years in Berkeley, she started numerous community development programs, particularly those for artists. She's a truly great champion for mentorship and making space for some of us pushy, eager, younger folks looking for opportunities to lead. She's now mentored 15 Yale School of Drama Theater Management students, several present today, and has maintained a stalwart commitment to the next generation of theater leadership, like the members of the Berkeley Rep Teen Council in attendance, if they're awake yet. But a visionary leader thinks way beyond merely growing a company, the complexity of the upcoming show, or even the problems of next season. As a leader, Susie is constantly vigilant about the challenges and opportunities ahead, both for her company and for the industry on the whole. Daily, she demonstrates that a great managing leader can also be a force for positive change in the community and sees the potential for using theater's power of empathy to galvanize us and make us all better humans. She also has shown me how important it is to find joy in your job, to act with chutzpah, and to take pride in the people you train. She's been preparing her company, her mentees, and her peers to seek opportunity and embrace change for her whole career. And the days we're facing ahead, we will all be made better by her leadership. Tony Tacconi shared a few words with me, Susie's partner in crime and artistic director of Berkeley Rep for over 20 years. Uh, he wrote, Susie Medak is a mixture of the Barefoot Contessa and Tony Soprano. <laughs> she makes a mean brisket and knows how to use a gun. <laughs> Skills that she has used to nurture and protect the fellow travelers that make up Berkeley Rep. She is the consummate manager, loving and tough. No nothing gets past her even when it should. Whatever award she's getting, you can be sure she'll be sending emails later today to find out how we're all holding up without her. Since I left Berkeley, I still call Susie regularly when I face my most complex challenges. She's counseled me on taking my first managing director role, on how to maintain balance, on the hard choices that come with leadership, the magic of dealing with a board, and even the loss of a parent. I've known Susie as a boss, a mentor, an inspiration, an obstacle, a real estate maven, an expert traveler, a den mother, the mayor of Addison Street, and a dear friend. So however you've known her, or whatever you may have called her, to my many peers, and I meant that that way. <laughs> to my many peers in the audience, current and former reptiles, 
members of the LORT board she's served with, members of the TCG board, and anyone she's influenced, please stand and join me in, in honoring this visionary leader. I actually didn't expect to be moved. <laughs> I, I, told, I told Teresa, you know, if this is what it, they needed to do to get me to a meeting, you know, <laughs> there are easier ways to do it. <laughs> uh, she is standing. I'm just going to do it. She is standing. Um, Thank you, Megan. I just have to say something. It's off script, but so Megan used to sit in our board meetings, and I'd and and I'd uh, I'd say, you know, I'm not going to be here forever, and she'd sit there and she'd go, eight more years, <laughs> <laughs> and I still like her. <laughs> Six. <laughs> um, in any case, um, thank you, Megan. I want to thank TCG. I want to thank the panel that saw so fit to recognize my contributions. I'd also like to just thank the, my husband, Greg, and my board president, Stuart, our board president, Stuart, for um, being here today to bear witness. Um, although I don't feel particularly visionary, and I'm not at all convinced that um, I've earned this, I'm also really happy at this moment to actually have the microphone. Because um, there's a few things that have been on my mind, and I don't, oh, well, why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> I do have to warn you, I was told that I had two minutes. Yeah, but you know what? One of the things about being a visionary is that you don't pay attention to what other people tell you. <laughs> um, so, there's, there's many people here, I have to say, who I have learned from, and many people here who I've had the enormous pleasure of trying to help learn. And one of the things that I hope you all share with me is an ex a sense of really the extraordinary generosity of this field. I don't think it is true in every field that you always have somebody who's looking out to give you a leg up. And that's something that I think is a rare and wonderful thing about what we do. So I've been teaching and mentoring young managers for over 15 years, and with increasing frequency, I hear this question from them. Will there be a job that I'll still want when I'm ready to lead a company? Will there be a theater that will value me for my leadership skills that will also let me be a person of the theater? Will I be able to find a partner who will include me rather than keeping me at arm's length? Will I find a partner who appreciates that I'm not an arts manager I'm a theater manager. Will I find someone who understands what motivates me is not crunching numbers, but actually making theater? I always assure them when they ask me those questions, oh yes, yes, don't worry, there will be somebody. <laughs> sometimes that feels truthful and sometimes it feels like a lie. I have grave concerns because over the last 20 years, I've watched as artistic staffs have become siloed in theaters operating as if they are the only keepers of the artistic flame, and increasingly relegating all contact with artists to members of the artistic staffs. Functions that were handled in the past by general managers, company managers, managing directors, uh, production managers are now often handled by artistic administrators, line producers, and a wealth of other people with creative titles. I've been thinking about how we got here when the growth of the field throughout the last 50 years has had so much to do with both great artists and with great administrators. After all, where would Zelda have been without Tom Fitzchandler, Joe Papp without Bernie? As a field, we do nothing in small increments. 
We as a group tend to go full throttle into whatever problem we've identified. It is one of our best qualities, but it also means that we swing wholeheartedly with 100% commitment from one priority to another uh, as a new problems are identified. Now, I may be wrong, but I trace this particular problem that I've identified to the day when our much admired Zelda Fitch Handler called us all out, oh, so many years ago, for having created organizations with great administrative skills while our artistry had not achieved the same high marks. As a field, we took that concern to heart, vowing to reinvest in the artistry at the core of our organizations. But I fear that what we did was exactly what we so often do in this field. We threw ourselves wholeheartedly into making better theater. But instead of simply elevating our investment in art, we also devalued the skills and expertise of the administrators who were helping to lead those organizations. We started a process of marginalizing the skilled managers who'd helped to build our theaters. We assumed that because someone was a good director, they must also be good at marketing. <laughs> they must be really good at organizational behavior. <laughs> they must really know from long-range planning. And now, years later, we have declining attendance, worrisome philanthropic trends, a complex regulatory environment, fundamental changes in our communities that are unlike anything that we've seen since the founding of our field. At the risk of being run out of town on a rail, which you guys would be really good at, I argue that great art alone is not going to make the theater healthy in America. We need great artistic leaders and, more than ever, we need administrative leaders who will help us navigate these uncertain times. So I want to urge our artistic leaders to reinvest in partnerships with strong administrative partners. Think of them as among your most important collaborative partners rather than as the naysayers you need to push against. They may not be your collaborative partners in making plays, but they are your collaborative partners in making your theaters. Think of them as the people who are going to bring a different kind of thinking that supports your vision, maybe expands your vision, and helps you achieve your vision. Think of them as fellow theater lovers, who, while they are held accountable by a board of directors for different elements of success than you are, share your passion for theater, and probably share your passion for the very theater that you're running. <laughs> Think of them as being like any good partner, whether it's a husband, a wife, or whatever, the one person charged with making you the best that you can be, and that your task is the, to do the same for them. We do not reimagine our relationship with our administrative, if we do not reimagine our relationship with our administrative leaders, we are not, and we do not start making these jobs more attractive for the next generation of great theater managers, I fear we may find ourselves striving to make stunning theater with no money and no audiences. So I ask you not, have you hugged your partner today? <laughs> because I know you have. <laughs> but rather, have you had a really good, heady disagreement with your partner today? Have you reached consensus on a project that because you've put your heads together has become a better project? Have you covered each other's asses today? Have you picked up after each other's messes this week? And if not, my question to you is, isn't it about time? So I want to thank you again for recognizing my contributions. I hope that I can continue to make them for a number more years. Yeah. <laughs> and in closing, I, I, have a, um, I have a message for all of the Berkeley reptiles who are here today, and that includes you, Lori, and Kyle, and Pam, and all of you know who you are. We actually want to take a company picture over here after the proceedings at 10. So join us there. <laughs> Thank you.
Susie, thank you for your remarks and for everything you've done for the field. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome our next plenary speaker to the stage. Jeff Chang has written extensively on the intersection of race, art, and civil rights, and the socio-political forces that guided the hip-hop generation. His books include We Gonna Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation, Who We Be, and Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation. He has written for The Nation, The New York Times, and many more, and currently serves as the Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. Please join in welcoming me, Jeff Chang. Good morning. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you so much to the staff of uh, Theater Communications Group um, for making the space for all of us and uh, for the kind invitation for me to be here. It's really a great honor for me to be here. I'm another Berkeley person. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it's such an honor for me to be able to be here um, speaking to all of you, uh, to an organization that has played such a crucial role at the forefront of equity and inclusion and diversity and freedom and justice in the theater and the performing arts, uh, and to an organization that's always been on the cutting edge of aesthetics uh, in American theater. I've been really privileged to be able to work with TCG for over a decade, um, from a period in the early 2000s, when TCG was doing what it always does, which is um, spotting the next thing, understanding the future aesthetics, and uh, I was part of a new generation of writers and uh, playwrights and actors and performers who are interested in these kinds of questions. And so you embraced us back then. And uh, for me to see a number of my peers and my mentors on the cover of American theater, it's like that old song on the cover of the Rolling Stone. <laughs> um, uh, it, it meant when we had arrived, right? And this is like 13 years ago. Uh, so for me, it feels like a uh, full circle to be able to be back here uh, today. Uh, a homecoming in a kind of a way to address you all today. Now, of course, we live in different times. Hip-hop theater in the form of Hamilton has been recognized as having generated something of a creative rebirth for, um, uh, for the arts. And even the conservatives want to be down, right? <laughs> they, <laughs> but they're acting like snowflakes <laughs> around this. Uh, they're acting like they want theater to be amended uh, to be a safe space for them. These were Trump's words, right? <laughs> it, you know, it looks like that. I actually love this. It looks like that because I have an app on my computer browser that renders all of Donald Trump's tweets in crayon. <laughs> It just makes it so much easier to wake up in the morning and put on Twitter, right? So, <laughs> so he's saying the theater must always be a safe and special place, right? That the cast of Hamilton was very rude last night to a very good man, Mike Pence, and that we should apologize. Now, nobody understands the need for safety more than those who always live in condi conditions of unsafety, right? No one understands the need for security more than those who live under the conditions of insecurity. Nobody understands the need for stability more than those who live under the conditions of precarity, right? But that's why we have to continue to use our art to comfort the afflicted and to afflict uh, the comfortable, right? <laughs> These are not times, these are not times for us to apologize. There's never been a more important time for us to tell the truth, to tell our stories, to openly affirm our values of openness and equity, of freedom and justice, to imagine a better society and a better world. Now is that time. Because every morning, we're waking up to a different kind of a theater, right? The worst kind of a theater. The performances are predictable. 
the actors have a very limited range of emotion. <laughs> the writing is terrible. <clears throat> the words don't even make sense, like kofefe, right? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? Meaning has left the building. These are performances that have no generosity, that display a complete lack of imagination. Like if I was grading my students, that's what I'd write. No generosity, no lack of, uh, no imagination. The characters undergo no transformation, right? The plot leads only in one direction, uh, to a soul-killing, body-crushing kind of an end. It's only the kind of theater that seeks to uh, perform aggression and domination. So we can read from a set of lines uh, much quoted uh, the other week from H.R. McMaster, the President's National Security Advisor, and Gary Cohn, his director of the National Economic Council, right, so security and economics, which lays out Trumpism in the most cogent and naked of ways. The President embarked on his first foreign trip with a clear-eyed outlook that the world is not a global community but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businesses engage and compete for advantage. We bring to this form unmatched military, political, economic, cultural, and moral strength. Rather than deny this elemental nature of international affairs, we embrace it. Right. So this worldview is supposed to be understood as a kind of clarifying realism. And it does. It clarifies the way that a punch or a bomb clarifies, right? But what does it aspire to? As some have pointed out, it doesn't aspire to very much at all. It's a world in which the means are the ends, in which all is war, in which there's no pretense of higher virtue, and where all are motivated by the most base of desires to dominate. It's less the invisible hand than the permanent fist. It's an orientation towards death. One never gets respect by demanding it, right? One doesn't get loyalty by demanding it. One doesn't receive trust or generation by requiring it. At best, one gets a deference that's kind of temporary. Not kind of, definitely temporary, right? More likely, as Rebecca Solnit puts it, one becomes the most mocked man in the world. Respect and loyalty and trust and generosity comes to do those who do the hard work of giving it and earning it. And it's always easier to tear down than to build up. And so we've seen what happens when one tears down civility. So here we are, right? We're in Portland, the city of roses, Bridgetown. But moving under the flag of free speech, we've seen terror born of hatred. We've seen those who use free speech to spew hatred and provoke violence, who are eager to claim their rights but not their responsibilities. I live in Berkeley, and so I've seen this kind of rise of a kind of street theater about a block and a half away from the rep, right? These are performers who dress themselves as rebels. They even adopt the language of the oppressed. They adopt the language of hip hop. Uh, one of the white supremacists known on the disturbance circuit calls himself based stick man. And I wonder what Lil B or Dead Prez would think of that. Hmm? These are shock troops of hatred, whether Milo or Ann Coulter or Bay Stickman, and they've come to our communities armed to the teeth to stage their spectacles of domination. They're meant to remind people of color, queers, women, and all those who believe in justice, dignity, and freedom that their place is to remain silent and oppressed. They're responding to a call to preserve the status quo using the chosen tools of the establishment. And so the logic of racism, of sexism, of homophobia, of capitalism is uncloaked in these spectacles of street theater. Hatred against us has been given free reign. Violence against us has been made acceptable. Provocateurs mock our values of openness and inclusion. They turn our towns into battlefields for the culture wars. And so from Portland to Maryland, our death toll rises. We face systems that reproduce inequality and racism and sexism and homophobia that do the greatest harm to those least able to shield themselves, that rely upon violence to support themselves. These are systems of 
accumulation of alienation that separate us from each other, that take life as not something to be taken care of and nurtured and protected, uh, but as a zero-sum game in which the winners take alls uh, and the losers take nothing. So we're at a turning point. In this moment, we can't remain on the fence. We cannot be bystanders. Uh, as ACT UP taught us, silence equals death. And Rebecca writes about the difference between silence uh, and quiet. Silence is impose. Quiet is something we ask for, that we develop for ourselves. So silence equals death. Exclusion equals death. Inequality, inequity equals death. And so in this moment, privilege shows up as disengagement, in the refusal to take a stand, in the refusal to show up. <laughs> as in, I refuse to see how anti-black racism preserves my own privilege. As in, I, I refuse to see the inhumanity of a system that leaves so many displaced and unsheltered. As in, I refuse to see the humanity of the refugee or the migrant. As in, I refuse to acknowledge the ways that state violence is inflicted on black bodies, on queer bodies, on Muslim bodies, on poor bodies. As in, I refuse to treat the bounty of the land, the air, the water, as a kuliana as of all, the right and the responsibility of all, but instead as a scarcity that I must hoard for myself. As in, I refuse to join the rest of the world uh, in ending global warming. I might choose to visit the glaciers before they're gone, or that Pacific hideaway before it's underwater, right? But I refuse to join the rest of the world in solving the, broad, the broader problem. Privilege is having the choice to isolate, to draw the line, to close the gate, to build the wall. To say that all that matters is my solitary sovereignty and what I can accumulate before death claims me. And so as artists, as people living in community in this moment, we must choose. Art reflects the infinite ways that we navigate life. It's about finding feeling in the multitude of variations we experience ourselves, uh, in the ways that we experience each other and our world. We stand against the machines of domination, of violence and death, against the machines that breed isolation and division amongst us. We choose to engage. We choose to protect life, to shelter life, to embrace life. We are all here today because we believe in this. We believe in art. We are also here because we believe the, the ugliness, right, the violence of inhumanity can and must be transformed. We're here today because we believe that art and culture changes things. That cultural change might even bring about political change. We believe in art because we believe in life and all its variations and all of its beauty. We learn from an early age to see difference. We learn to tell the difference between ourselves and others. And so when we're kids, difference is just difference. And it also may be the beginning of something else. Learning to see difference might be the beginning of empathy, which produces the possibility of community. But as we get older, we humans sometimes begin to attach meaning to difference, uh, meanings that are not so neutral. And we begin to become aware of the way that we've been sorted into systems, right? Systems of freedom and slavery, of commitment and neglect, of investment and abandonment, of mobility and containment. But then rather than confront those systems, sometimes some might choose to draw a veil over those systems, pretend that they don't even exist. So racism is supported by a specific kind of refusal. It's a denial of empathy. It's a mass willed blindness. And this is how inequity comes to be reproduced in each generation. In 1952, Ralph Ellison described the condition that black people faced as one of invisibility. He wrote, I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. And for decades, this was a primary condition 
for all people of color, all marginalized folks. But we fought through, and we began to change things. A little over a decade after Invisible Man, a group of black artists who were inspired by the civil rights movement, including Norman Lewis, formed a collective, and they called it Spiral. A spiral could go inward and down, like water down a sink. Right? And this is the view that Ellison actually had of history, that the vicious racism of the South might not just be that of the South uh, and the US, but the future as well, a spiral down towards death. But these artists thought of a different kind of spiral. Uh, one of the artists in the collective, Hale Woodruff, referred to what they were talking about in these words. He was referring to the Archimedean spiral. He said, because from a starting point it moves outward, embracing all directions, yet constantly forward. It was an image of perfect natural form, the embodiment of beauty, diversity, organicity, inevitability, a spiral up towards life. And so they began to show new visions of movement, imagine new forms of consciousness that then cohered into the black arts movement. And then we saw this flowering, right, of all these different types of identity and arts movements uh, from that and within that and intersecting with that. Chicano movement, right, the Native American movement, Asian American movement, feminist movement, queer movement. People began to rethink their identities, their very selves, their communities. And so in this picture, Lewis depicts an uprising of the people against the white supremacy that he was seeing in Alabama and the KKK. And a decade later, the multiculturalism movement was announced in the Bay Area by Ishmael Reed and his colleagues, the men and women of the Yardbird Collective, uh, which included poets like Al Young and playwrights like Ntozaki Shange. And they argued that the US had never been monocultural and white only, that it had been shaped always by all of the peoples uh, who made it up. And that this was nothing to fear, nothing to fear. It was just a shift in consciousness to make. But if fear is what you must do, then as Flavor Flav said a decade later, right? Armageddon's been in effect, go get a lay pass. <laughs> and then it's the greatest story to me still ever told, right? How abandoned, forgotten kids of African descent, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latino, Puerto Rican youths in the Bronx and other neighborhoods in New York City built from the ruins of civil society, a kind of cultural movement that over four decades later continues to allow people all around the world to be able to be seen and to speak. These were revolutions of being. They said, we are here, we've always been here. The only urgency now <clears throat> is for you to open your eyes and see. And so too, these were revolutions that demanded seeing. They were revolutions not just of being, but of seeing. That we see each other in our full humanity, that we recognize each other in our full humanity. And so they were revolutions of consciousness. They did not require bloodshed. They only require that we stand up as ourselves, proudly, that we never apologize for our right to be, and that we learn how to see each other in our full being. And so by the end of the 1970s, Tony K. Bambara had coined a motto of sorts uh, for the movement. He sa she said, the responsibility of the artist, the work of an artist, is to make this revolution irresistible. Now in the years after Obama, it's clear that we've reached the point in history where people of color are hyper-visible, or marginalized folks are now hyper-visible. And Ellison was prescient here as well, right? He also wrote, when they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. And so the kinds of images that preceded Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown Renisha McBride, and Rakia Boyd, Tamir Rice, Alex Nieto, so many more. As, Allison, as Ellison said, when they approach me, they see only my surroundings themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. 
And so the movement for black lives has called upon us to see each other, right? So that we can find a way from the death spiral into the life spiral. This is the work of our time. Right now we're caught in a bad, uh, bad circle, a bad loop of history, a cycle of crisis like a, a wheel in reverse. And so it takes us back to 1992, 25 years ago, the Los Angeles riots. And this takes us back even further to 1965, over a half century ago, the year of Selma, the year of the peak of the civil rights movement, the year not incidentally that the National Endowment for the Arts was chartered, right? The year of the last national consensus for racial justice and cultural equity. It's in 1965 that the civil rights movement hit its zenith. <clears throat> and then in August, a California highway patrol officer pulled over two African Americans two blocks from their home in Watts. Uh, the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. And in the chaos that followed, both of the men and their mother were beaten and taken to jail. And the crowd tossed rocks and they tossed bottles at the departing police car. And after the car was gone, a six day uprising began. And so 1965 was also the beginning of the post civil rights era. And it's an era that's been defined by a rich, vital culture born of demographic change but a politics that's been mobilized around racial backlash. It's been a period of resegregation, sometimes slow and creeping, sometimes loud and violent. And so from 1965 to 1992 to 2014 on up to now, we seem caught in a cycle of crisis. There's a crisis, there's a reaction, there's a backlash, there's a sense of exhaustion and then we fall into another crisis. And the question is, how do we escape? How do we escape this death spiral, this cycle of crisis? And so we need creativity in this period. We need the arts to help us find new imaginations, new words for our time. And we're asked in this moment to build bridges across the divides, to try to close the growing gaps of inequality and segregation. So let's talk about some of those gaps right now. We can start right here at Home in the Arts. In recent years, the arts world has been pushed to deal with what it euphemizes as issues of diversity. <laughs> From Oscars So White to current controversies around the content of plays and paintings. And yet this word diversity has become so toothless. Diversity is a fact, right? Diversity is just a fact. And so is climate change, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yet leaders find ways, they find new ways every day to say how they believe in both even as they're working so hard in the opposite direction to make things worse, right? Diversity means nothing without equity. And so we can comfort ourselves with a picture of diversity while tolerating the reality of rising inequality and rising resegregation. And so what we've been pushing for, right, have not been a focus on issues of diversity, but issues of equity. And equity, real equity, shows up in three kinds of ways. Representation, access, and power. Representation on the stage and in front of the camera, yes but also a seat at the table. Access to institutions of power and advancement, yes, but also to the traditions and the ways and the practices that have helped us to survive. The power to raise one's voice and be heard, yes, but also the power to make decisions. And representation, access, and power show up as distributed unequally. Here's a couple of ways they show up, right? All of the largest museums, theaters, and dance companies in the US, the largest ones, the top five, have budgets of more than $23 million. But only five, uh, only the top five uh, of the largest African American and Latino museum, theaters, and dance companies uh, in the US uh, have budgets 
of more than, 20, uh, than $5 million. And here's something that's even more disturbing in some ways, right? Uh, the New York City uh, Office of Cultural Affairs, uh, Department of Cultural Affairs, did a survey of 1,000 New York arts organizations, and 69% of those polled agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I feel my organization is diverse. And yet 78% of board members and 79% of leadership staff in the same organizations are white. In a city that's 33% white. So again, the picture of diversity and the reality of inequity. If we want to get to the heart of the matter, we can remind ourselves that since the massive defunding of the NEA during an earlier period of the culture wars, because we're still in it, we're still in the culture wars right now, the agenda of the state has been to push funding of the arts towards two sectors, right? Towards the corporate sector and the philanthropic sector. And so what the culture wars have left us with is this neoliberal doctrine that says, if it's not good enough to make money, it's not important enough art to make, right? Or you're left to your own wealth or the wealth of your friends or others, right? And so while crowdfunding has become a thing in recent years, it's never been enough to sustain massive arts making for an extended period of time. And as for the philanthropic sector, here's what we've got. Of every foundation dollar, 11 cents goes to the arts, five and a half cents goes to arts organizations with budgets of more than $5 million. One cent goes to arts organizations serving underrepresented communities, and less than half a cent goes to arts organizations for social justice work. This is inequality that's deeper than our own vast income inequality in the US, right? And it's reflective, of course, of all these other divides that have been happening over the last half century. So we can move next to talking about the next generation of young Americans who are coming up, who, of course, demographers say are the most diverse generation the US has ever seen, prompting a little bit of jealousy in me because we were a part of the last generation that was the most diverse generation <laughs> of Americans that had ever been seen. But I try not to hold that against them because I teach them every day. <laughs> my own struggles. Uh, big fat book, my struggle. <laughs> and so this is the most diverse generation of young folks that the US has ever seen, but they're coming of age in a resegregating country. The peak of desegregation in the schools happened in 1989, which was a great year for hip hop, right? And it's not unrelated, actually, right? And what we know is that most students of color are attending majority minority schools, but that whites are still the most segregated group of all. The average white student attends a school that's 75% white. So we have an entire generation that's coming of age with resegregation as their reality. One of the biggest discussions in the global city right now is over gentrification. And so we can take the case of the San Francisco Bay Area, right, where I call home, uh, which has begun, become ground zero for a lot of these kinds of discussions. And what we've seen there, of course, is galloping inequality. Here's the racial gap uh, income-wise now between white and black median households in San Francisco County. Displacement, of course, is the story behind these numbers. But people who are displaced have to go somewhere, right? And so now Oakland is the fifth highest rental market in the country, Oakland, California, right? The domino effect of displacement continues. So folks are forced out of Oakland further out into the Delta, right, into Antioch, or into Oakley, or into Stockton, into the Valley, into Tracy. And what we know is that this is happening all across the country, right? That people being displaced out of the cities uh, and into the aging suburbs. Suburbs with names like Sanford, Florida, or Ferguson, Missouri. We've seen the suburbanization of poverty and the colorization uh, of suburbia. And homelessness is skyrocketing. In Oakland, homelessness has grown by 25% in the last year alone. And so this is the moment that we're in, right? This moment of severe precarity. Precarity defines our time. And the term gentrification is too small to understand what's really at work. Gentrification centers the wealth that's being 
moving into the cities, the gentry that are moving into the cities. But it disappears those who are being forced out uh, of the cities. And so gentrification is part, a small part, of the larger problem of resegregation. And all of this, all of this boils down to the fundamental question of life expectancy. What we know is that a non-Hispanic black male can expect to live seven years less than the average American. And here again is why we say black lives matter. And so we fight every day against the weight of history. We're always fighting against the weight of history. We can talk about the ways history has come full circle even right here uh, in this place where we are right now. The history of Oregon country is one that begins with race. It's haunted by exclusion and genocide. The first displacement came with the genocide and removal of native peoples from their lands. The Paiutes, the Coast Salish, the Chinook, the Tekelma, the Athabascan, the Klamath, the Modoc, so many others. And at the same time that white miners and settlers were attacking the tribes, they placed language into their constitution stating that no free Negro or mulatto not residing in the state at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall come, reside, or be within this state, or hold any real estate. This law followed the infamous Lash Law, which literally gave whites the right to whip blacks every six months until they voluntarily left the territory. Oregon was founded as an all-white uh, uh, state and territory. And the constitutional language here that you see wasn't repealed until a statewide vote in 2002. Over the past year and a half, this is a history that's been coming back full circle. Last January uh, 2016, the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge was occupied by Eamon Bundy. And a group of white rogues claimed that the feds had stolen lands from white ranchers. <laughs> the Burns Paiute tribe had to correct them. They said, hey, the land had been taken by whites about 140 years before this. For 40 days, the Bundys were allowed to trash the property, destroy indigenous artifacts, cultural items. Their occupation cost taxpayers $9 million, and they were acquitted of all charges in October. Portland remains the whitest city, major city in the country. These are maps from, a city, uh, from the city itself showing 2010 census data, right? You can see communities of color are largely on the outskirts of the city, such as the northeastern tracks that border the airport, right? And we can match that with the poverty maps. There's a large correspondence. And this in turn reflects the long-term legacy of racial segregation in the city. This last map shows the areas where diversity is decreasing, right? It measures the diversity the index. It's the likelihood that two people chosen at random from the same area belong to a different race or ethnic group. And the areas of diagonal lines show where diversity is increased or decreasing. Right? So many of those tracks happen to be in areas where median prices for homes have been rising the fastest, uh, especially in these areas just east of downtown. And I don't show these maps to denigrate the city. I love Portland. And Portland is no different from any other city in this country. And like my own home of the Bay Area, the same places that are the front lines of resistance are on the front lines of increasing inequality and resegregation. And so these are the kinds of contradictions that we are being called to confront. History doesn't need to be destiny, but it surely won't change until we face up to it and choose to act. Lately in the news, there's been talk of a strange kind of futurism. I'm oh, sorry. Can I slow down? OK. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this strange kind of futurism. When we talk about the past and the present. Let's talk about this futurism, right? The rise of these luxury doomsday bunkers. Doomsday bunkers for the extremely rich. These are people who have accumulated so much wealth that they wouldn't know what to do with it 
but for the fear they've accumulated as well, right? For years, they've said to themselves, I made this. I made this, right? Not taking into account all of the labor that supported them making this, right? And so now they talk amongst themselves about uprising in which those people, and it's always those people, violently revolt against them, in which they are the targets of some sort of apocalyptic vengeance and rage. And perhaps the saddest thing about this is what it reveals about what they believe about themselves, or what it may reveal about what they believe about themselves. That since they can't imagine any kind of generosity, they can't nurture it within their own view of their future, right? And this is maybe what the neo-Marxists meant when they said it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. <laughs> and so they've taken to refashioning these abandoned missile silos in the Midwest to build themselves bunkers where they can protect themselves from society. It's the ultimate escape hatch. And it's complete with simulated exterior windows, uh, with pools, with climbing walls, and of course, dog parks. <laughs> and so this is a logical conclusion. Dog parks, yeah. I'm from the Bay Area. We have a lot of those. And this is a logical conclusion of capitalism and racism and, and systems that support inequality. Complete and total withdrawal from the social, from almost every kind of tie and responsibility. A future where some live bunkered away from the many and where all else is imagined as nothing but ruins. It's the imagination of the death spiral. And here's the strange truth in this strange historical moment, that the best remedy may be more art, that art can be the rem remedy to the orientation towards death. And why? It's because in these moments when we uh, are blinded by spectacle, by allusion to each other, where it seems most that we can't see each other and only s instead see our surroundings, ourselves, or figments of our imagination, that art may allow us to see again. It may allow us to close the gaps again. In its mimicry of life, art helps to close the distance between the self and the other. It helps us to come together. And another way to say this, of course, is that through art, we learn once again how to experience empathy. And empathy is the first necessary step towards equity. Now, it's important to say empathy is not enough. Empathy creates the possibility of community and the possibility of equity. But empathy is empty without action. And equity requires work. It means making the values, the pleasures, the ways of knowing and being that the arts and culture enable to be valued by all. It means fair representation, inclusion and access. And fundamentally, it means shared rights shared responsibilities, shared power. It comes down to forming relations between ourselves and others that are not based in domination, exploitation, or extraction, but in exchange, generosity, and trust, the building blocks of community, the essential elements for a spiral that circles up towards life. And so here's a picture of Vigo Rockefeller, right, who uh, had one of the uh, first hip hop theater companies uh, along with her partner, Quick Step, right? And it's called Full Circle. And we can think about equity beginning in the circle. The circle is a powerful metaphor for community. In the circle, all points are equidistant from the center. In the circle, we can all see each other. The circle is also the space of creation, the cipher, right? Where tradition returns and innovation happens, where the relationship between the individual and the community is restored, where the community affirms itself, reaffirms itself, and tests itself, and emerges transformed. To the five percenters, zero is the cipher. It marks the completion of the cycle, the highest attainment. And so this finally brings us to the work of the late, great Grace Lee Boggs and her thinking about the idea of revolution. Grace argued that we need to think of Revolution is not something that's won in bloodshed or the violent seizure of power, where we replace one group in charge with another group in charge. But as she put it, the next revolution might be better thought of as, quote, advancing humankind to a new stage of consciousness, creativity, and social and political responsibility. 
Her revolution will require us to move away from finding new ways to divide and rule, to consign some to death, and instead pivot to life, to honor and transform ourselves and our relations to each other. She insists that we think how we see each other and how we choose to be and be together. She urges us to move beyond feeling empathy into acting towards mutuality. Now we start from seeing each other and move into acting for each other. For those of us who believe in justice and equity and freedom, it's always going to be our special burden to explore and advance new imaginations that arouse desires for change. All that the forces of reaction have to do is reappropriate what we've done to preserve the status quo. So our constant struggle is going to be to overcome that stasis. And that requires us to move people, to seduce people, to inspire people, to manifest ideas of a nation and a society that has not yet been, to make revolution irresistible. Luckily, as artists, this is where we feel exactly at home, right? Art, as many people have said, is a gift. It's something that works at the level of the exchange, but at its best, it continues to give long after the act of making it and sharing it has passed. It's a gift that continues to give, right? It's the epitome of generosity. And so no wonder its impact is so hard to measure. How do you fix a value on something whose exchange value multiplies over generations and across geographies? Remember, too, that revolution is the closing of a, uh, an old circle, a uh, closing, excuse me, of a new circle, right? It's one that's begun as a movement out of an old circle. And so just as the artists before us initiated these revolutions of being and seeing, so we can move out of this cycle of crisis and death into a cycle of abundance in life, out of resistance into transformation. I love this city. I love its people. I love its spirit of generosity. Portland is a city that deeply believes in life, that feels deeply, that indeed has felt like the pulse of the resistance. Right after last uh, November's election, I found myself here uh, in Portland. I was exhausted. I was emotionally spent. I was really trying hard to process. And the students and the staff and the faculty at Lewis and Clark, they invited me in. They welcomed me. And I found myself at a round dining table where everybody was trying to metabolize the shift, the sort of uh, new world, right? trying to find a true north, a new true north. And their desire to step up and confront uh, these new conditions helped me to do the same. I've been thinking and writing about loops of history, about cycles of crisis, and thinking that eight years ago and some change, right? When people came together to elect Barack Obama, and it was announced that he had won, people poured into the streets. There were spontaneous celebrations. There was music. In Oakland, folks were doing their sideshows. We were feeling ourselves, right? When Trump was elected, people took to the streets in rage and defiance. I was staying right here in downtown, and each day I was speaking with folks in the area, folks in Portland who are working through this deep soul searching with care, with openness. And each night I went to sleep with the sounds, the shouts, the hollers of the resistance uh, happening right below my window. And these things brought me a lot of comfort. And I think this is why they target us, right? This is why they target us in Berkeley, in Portland, uh, everywhere, everywhere that we're trying to make change. Why those who want to preserve the status quo, preserve inequality and privilege and terror and the death spiral, why they target us everywhere that we're active in dreaming, because they know our power, and it's the power of love. Our revolution is based in love and life. It can build places of dignity, of justice and equity. It can become infectious. It can become unstoppable. It can become irresistible. And there's no better place and time than right now and right here to begin to build the revolutions that will help us to turn this history around. Thank you very much. For this time. Thank you. Thank you.
appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was truly inspiring. I'm Kevin Moriarty. I'm the chair of the TCG board, and I am very uh, proud to have this opportunity to serve TCG with my fellow board members at this critical moment for our field. Each of our theaters at this time are facing so many challenges, securing appropriate capitalization and the necessary financial resources to make art, expanding our audiences and engaging our communities in an authentic way, creating organizations that are equitable, diverse, and inclusive, providing a dignified living wage for artists and the people who create and make the art that we all love. These challenges are made more difficult at a time when resources from the government and from foundations are increasingly scarce, when the NEA is under attack, when societal forces are at work to divide us and weaken our ability to come together around art. Sometimes it can feel like we're alone, but we are not alone. We have a collective that brings us all together. We have TCG. The mothers and fathers of the regional theater movement many years ago created TCG. We, as a field, created TCG all those years ago in order to provide us collectively with resources that we could not have on our own. Access to field-wide research and to surveys that allow us to understand best practices. National advocacy for arts funding because it requires speaking with a large collective voice to have power in the halls of government and artists need power convenings that bring us together so we can lift up the great and good work that we are doing and share those ideas with each other so that we can challenge each other to ever be better. Publishing the books and the plays that would not exist uh, in the marketplace for us to be able to experience, understand, to confront, and to produce. American Theater Magazine and Art Search, which connect us to what's happening in the field and allow us to move throughout the field. Resources that empower our member theaters to make proactive structural changes to create greater equity, diversity, and inclusion. TCG speaks with a collective voice, with our voice. TCG makes us stronger because we are stronger when we are together and gives us hope. We need you. TCG is you and we need you. We need you to contact us and let us know, to reach out to us when you face critical challenge and needs so that we can together mobilize the community to support you. We need you when you experience great art and good work in your communities to lift that up and share that with us so that we can amplify it and celebrate it with you. And we need financial support. Here's what happens when you join a board. <laughs> you learn a couple numbers. Here's a number that is a member for all these years I didn't know. Dues from members account for only 17% of TCG's expenses. We need your financial help. Here's what you can do. There's an insert that's in your uh, packets. 
and it says, hey, there's four ways that you could make a contribution. You could text us, you could go online, you could mail in a card, you could just walk up to the registration tables in person. You could just walk up and say, I just want to make a donation right now, even in person. The one that is the sexiest and most fun, and that maybe some of uh, our member theaters out there uh, are either doing or will, or will start to do after, after today, is that that phone number up there where you can text, they tell me all you have to do is you just take out your phone right now, you just, you just type in a dollar amount and hit send. That's it. That, that's what you have to do. You'll get a text back then with a little link that you can connect up on. You, you can type some fun thing, some like sexy comment or uh, fun emoji or something like that, but you can truly just type in a dollar amount. We'll be quite happy uh, about that. Hey, and here's the thing that is kind of fun and special. This is like that, that, that gift moment. If you make a contribution this weekend while at the conference of $100 or more, then your name will be included as a sponsor in the published version of Tony Kushner's The Intelligent Homosexual's Guide to Capitalism and Socialism with a Key to the Scriptures or IHO. Your name will actually be in that, in that book and also TCG will give you a free copy of the book. It's an incredible play, packed just dense with ideas and inspiration. And you could be a small part of that. And you could contribute to the idea that great plays make a difference. So all of us on the board at TCG, all of us in this room who are TCG, uh, thank you for the art that you're making, for the good work that you are doing in our communities for the challenges that you give uh, us to be ever better and we thank you very very much for your support so before we break, I want to remind you uh, housekeeping about two performance opportunities tonight. August Wilson Red Doors Project, the new Black Fest Hands Up, is playing tonight at 7.30 here at the Pavilion Ballroom. And also at 7.30, Teatro Linea de Sombras Amarillo is going to play an encore performance at Portland Center Stage at the Armory. Thank you very much for being with us at the plenary this morning. Have a great conference. <laughs>